Hey, this is Dr. K from iMedical School, and today we're going to talk about DIC, otherwise known as Disseminated Intravascular Coagulation. So, let's first start off to talk about what is DIC. DIC is a massive activation of your coagulation system, leading to multiple clot formations throughout the body, from macro to micro thrombi. At the same time, because your body is using up all these factors to create these clots, there are not enough clots to prevent your body from bleeding. So DIC is not only characterized by clot formation, but also by excessive bleeding. In patients who do have DIC, this is a red flag for a severe underlying disorder. DIC is never a primary diagnosis, but a secondary diagnosis. Before talking about the specifics of DIC, let's talk about coagulation. Coagulation is split up into primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis. Primary hemostasis is when there's damage to tissue or blood vessels, and platelets stick to this damage, creating a primary clot. The clot is strengthened by secondary hemostasis, and this involves the intrinsic, the extrinsic, and the common pathway. We won't go into the specifics of each pathway, but I'll highlight some important points. First, the intrinsic pathway is monitored by PTT. Your extrinsic pathway is monitored by your PT lab. The common pathway is very important, and both the intrinsic and extrinsic feed into the common pathway. In the common pathway, prothrombin is converted to thrombin by activated factor 10A. Thrombin is an enzyme or a protease that cleaves fibrinogen in inactive form to fibrin. The role of fibrin is to attach to your primary clot and stabilize slash strengthen that clot. In the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin, unnecessary parts of the protein are cleaved off, and these are known as fibrinogen degradation products, which is something we can measure in your serum. Now that we know the basics of coagulation, let's look at the details of DIC. So first, we'll look at what are the causes of DIC. The causes of DIC are wide, and they include trauma, vascular aneurysm, sepsis and severe infection, severe liver failure, transplant rejection, placental abruption, preeclampsia, pancreatitis or other severe organ dysfunction, amniotic fluid embolism, ABO transfusion incompatibility, last but not least, malignancy. Note all these disorders have systemic involvement, meaning they affect more than one organ, and that's probably the reason why they're associated with DIC. Now, how do you diagnose DIC? No single test diagnoses DIC. Really, you need to look at the entire clinical picture to lead you to a diagnosis of DIC. That includes the history, the physical, the labs. Next, we will look at labs that are commonly associated with DIC, and then we will take a look at a scoring system that can help aid us in our diagnosis. So first, let's take a look at thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia means a low platelet count. The reason thrombocytopenia develops in DIC is that because of the activation of the clotting system, primary hemostasis is activated, and those clots start to stick everywhere they can to form these primary clots, and thus they're consumed. Note, thrombocytopenia is sensitive for DIC, but it's not specific because a lot of things can cause thrombocytopenia. Next, we'll look at fibrinogen degradation products and D-dimer. Fibrinogen degradation products are a result of the clotting system activating and causing the cleavage of fibrinogen to fibrin, creating FDPs, or fibrinogen degradation products. The reason we measure fibrinogen degradation products in DIC is that if the body is activating the clotting system at a very rapid rate, fibrinogen is becoming converted to fibrin very quickly, producing a lot of fibrinogen degradation products. 
So if the FDPs are high, we could infer that the clotting system is undergoing a massive activation. Now, fibrinogen degradation products are hepatically and renally metabolized, that means through the liver and through the kidneys. Because of this, if the patient has liver or kidney dysfunction, the fibrinogen degradation products may be falsely elevated. So that's something to keep in mind when interpreting this test during a patient who you think has DIC. Now we will look at the coagulation labs that we commonly get on patients. So PT and PTT. PTT measures the intrinsic pathway and PT measures your extrinsic pathway. In about 50 to 60 percent of patients who have DIC, you will have a prolonged PT and PTT. Thus, you can actually use the PT and PTT to monitor DIC patients because they measure the pathways that involve the factors that are consumed in DIC. Another lab we commonly get is fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is classically used to diagnose and monitor DIC. However, you must realize fibrinogen in most cases may not be very helpful. And the reason why is fibrinogen has a very low sensitivity for the diagnosis of DIC at about 28%. Why is it so insensitive? Well, fibrinogen is an acute phase reactant, meaning when the body is stressed or sick, the body will produce fibrinogen. So the fibrinogen level may be falsely normal, though the body is rapidly consuming fibrinogen. Hypofibrinogenemia is rarely detected in DIC. Really, it's only seen in the most severe cases. Let's talk about schistocytes, which are fragmented RBCs. Fragmented RBCs, or schistocytes, are reported in patients with DIC, but usually they are only about 10% at the most of red blood cells. Sometimes they can be more. It's not a sensitive or specific finding in DIC because schistocytes are are associated with many other disorders, including mechanical heart valves, vasculitides. So you really, when you see schistocytes, consider other things that could be causing it, such as thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura or other microangiopathies. Now, let's talk about antithrombin and protein C. Antithrombin and protein C are involved in the coagulation cascade and are often reduced in DIC. Though they do not diagnose DIC, they have been shown to have a prognostic significance. The scoring system we use in DIC is part of the International Society for Thrombosis and Hemostasis DIC scoring system. It's a fairly simple system. It's a five-step diagnostic algorithm. The prerequisite is that the patient must have an underlying disorder known to be associated with DIC. It has 91% sensitivity and 97% specificity making the scoring system very good in diagnosing patients who have DIC. So let's go over the system for DIC. So first off, you want to know, does this patient have an underlying disorder known to be associated with over DIC? If the answer is a resounding no, then you, you cannot use the scoring system. However, if the patient does have an underlying disorder that's associated with DIC, you need to obtain coagulation tests. So your PT, platelet count, fibrinogen, and then a fibrin-related marker, such as FDPs or D-dimer. So now we have to understand how to interpret the labs that we obtained. So we use a scoring system based on these labs. So for your PT, if your PT is less than 3 seconds, you get 0 points. Greater than 3 but less than 6 seconds, you get 1 point. And then greater than or equal to six seconds, you get two points. Now let's move to the platelet count. So for patients who have a platelet of greater than 100,000, you get zero points. For patients who have platelets between 50 to less than or equal to 100,000, you get one point. And less than 50,000, you get two points. Next, we'll talk about fibrinogen levels. So for a fibrinogen level greater than one gram per liter, you get zero. And 
for a level less than one gram per liter, you get one point. Now let's move on to fibrin markers, so D-dimer or FDPs. If there's no increase, you get zero points. If there's a moderate increase, you get two points. And a strong increase, you get three points. Now let's calculate the score. If you get a score that's greater than or equal to five, that's compatible with overt DIC. For patients less than five, this is suggestive of a non overt DIC. So greater than or equal to 5, you have a definite diagnosis. If you have greater than or equal to 5, you need to calculate the score every day to monitor the patient and how they are doing with the DIC, whether or not they're improving or they're getting worse. The less than 5, we have a high clinical suspicion, recalculate in one to two days and see where the score has trended. All right, we've gone over diagnosis. Let's talk about treatment for DIC. So for treatment, you always want to treat the underlying disorder for DIC because DIC is a secondary diagnosis. But if the patient is actively bleeding or needs an invasive procedure and the plates are less than 50,000, I would go ahead and transfuse them with platelets. Now non-bleeding patients, our general goal is greater than 10,000 platelets. Just because less than 10,000, your risk of spontaneous bleeding is so high. Now, for patients with severe hypofibrinogenemia, like less than 1 gram per liter, even though they've had gotten FFP, then at that point, you can consider cryoprecipitate. But realize there is no data to suggest that this improves outcomes in DIC patients. Because DIC involves the creation of clots, there's always been this question whether heparin should be used in DIC. Now heparin does inhibit the activation of the coagulation part of DIC. But realize there's no randomized trial that's demonstrated heparin use in patients with DIC have improved outcomes. So generally we stick with the rule that if a patient is critically ill, they have suspected DIC, but there's absolutely no evidence or risk of bleeding at that point, then you can consider prophylaxis with heparin or low molecular weight heparin at prophylactic dosages to prevent clot formation. But this is really the minority of patients you'd probably be using this in. All right, we've gone over the, all right, we discussed what causes DIC, the diagnosis, and the treatment of DIC. If you like this video, give it a like. If you have any comments or any ideas for future videos, place a comment down below. And definitely subscribe to iMedical School. This is Dr. K from iMedical School, and I will see you next time.